Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Non-Fiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Hello and welcome to Read Smart. It's been an exciting time in the world of non-fiction as the winner of the 2022 Bailey Gifford Prize was announced by Caroline Sanderson, the chair of the judges, yesterday at a gala dinner sponsored by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Here is the moment the winner was announced. And I'm thrilled to say that our winner is a book that has not just a proper regard for the reader, it has a passionate regard for the reader. So the winner of the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction 2022 is Super Infinite, The Transformations of John Donne. And before Super Infinite was announced as the winner, I milled around with guests during the drinks reception at the gala dinner. There was a lively atmosphere of anticipation. I spoke with former judge, novelist Sarah Collins, the 2021 Chair of Judges, Andrew Holgate, and the pioneering Margaret Busby, Britain's first black female publisher. When you hear the strap line of the Bailey Gifford Prize saying all the best stories are true. What do you think about that as an idea? Well, I'm a novelist by trade, so I want to take issue with that. Uh, Just joking, all of the best stories are fundamentally true, in fact. And I love the fact that we can celebrate the sort of crossover in motivations and techniques uh, between writers of fiction and non-fiction so I'm delighted to be here. And you were a judge last year? I was yes. Tell me what that was like given that you are a fiction writer. How much non-fiction did you read before you were asked to read the squillions of books that you had to read for the prize? It was an eye-opener because I usually view reading non-fiction as like taking a dose of medicine you know it's good for you but it might not be delicious. Is it like eating broccoli? (laughs) A little bit, a little bit. But there was no broccoli last year. It was all absolutely fantastic. And some of those books knocked my socks off. The winner, in fact, Empire of Pain, which we chose unanimously, was such a masterpiece of sort of pace and narrative uh, craft and characterization that I'm definitely going to be taking some of the tricks I learned reading it into my novel writing. And you were last year's chair of the judges, Andrew. I was. And tell me what that was like, because lots of people tonight have been saying this is a really tough prize to judge because you're you're basically judging apples versus pears and oranges. And I, yeah, I think I don't think it's any different from uh, a fiction prize. Uh, I I think I think if you know a good book, it doesn't. You know, you can you can compare. I think yeah. I, I don't have a problem with that. And you just stepped down from being the literary editor of the Sunday Times. Were you someone who read a lot of non-fiction before? No, I think weirdly, although most of our pages were made up of non-fiction, mostly what we read was fiction, because it's much more difficult uh, to sort it, you know, and to know what's good and what's not so good, So, uh, and it, which is a weird uh, way of doing things. So um, I'm slightly relieved of that uh, obligation now. <laughs> but do you think that it improved your your ear, your eye for non-fiction, having judged this prize? That's interesting. I think to have read as many books as we did last year and seen the horizon, uh, seen the full purview of everything, I think it does. I think it does. I think you know what's out there. You know the sort of books that are out there. Yes. I think it does. And this argument, which I keep hearing, and and I kind of grapple with it myself, the strapline for the Bailey Gifford is all the best stories are true. And of course, anyone who reads fiction or has for their entire life believes that fiction within its pages reveals truths too. I'm now a non-fiction guy. I really am. I really am. (laughs) It's got extra frisson if it's real. And it's amazing. It's just got an extra frisson about it. Margaret, you've never been a judge on the Bailey Gifford Prize. I haven't, no. But you have been a judge of many literary fiction prizes. I've certainly been a judge of the Booker Prize. That was my last big judging. Um, so, when you, so when you see the strap line here for the Bailey Gifford saying all the best stories are true, what do you think about that? Well, 
It depends on how you interpret it, because I, I suppose that ev everybody who writes is writing from within themselves, and so it's true to them. It, it might be fiction, it might be factual, and how do we know if we haven't written it? Are you a big non-fiction reader? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't recently had so much time to read for pleasure because I've spent so much time judging prizes or reviewing books or reading books so that I can endorse them for all my <laughs> friends, which is another chore, which is lovely, but it, it's sort of time-consuming. So there, there are lots of books that I, uh, I'm looking forward to read, and certainly all, all the books on, on the, on the shortlist here are, are on my list. And now it is my huge pleasure to be able to welcome this year's winner, Catherine Rundle, author of Super Infinite, The Transformations of John Donne, which explores the many aspects of one of Britain's most enduring poets. Thank you so much for joining us and many, many congratulations, Catherine. Thank you so much. I am truly thrilled. <laughs> um, you are also probably exceptionally tired because you've been talking all day. This is the last <laughs> of your big interviews, I think. I'm delighted to be doing it, though. <laughs> Um, let's let's start right at the beginning and tell me why John Donne and when you first encountered his writing. I first encountered John Donne as a child. My parents uh, used to stick little bits of poetry by the bathroom sink where we brushed our teeth, mostly Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, but occasionally some John Donne, um, the more child-friendly, you know, not, not the erotic verse, <laughs> things like, you know, go and catch Phew, a what a relief. Star. I know, <laughs> you must accidentally impugn my parents. Um, and so I encountered him then, and I, of course, didn't understand him, but I understood that there was something in the rhythm of the words that had its own power. And then I really encountered him properly at university and and fell truly in love with, with everything that he was able to do. He was a man who was able to hold in one poem, in one piece of prose, the vastness of, of humanity. He was a man who lived through enormous pain and trauma. He was um, Catholic at a time when that was to be persecuted. He probably saw his great uncle hung, drawn and courted. Um, he was certainly taken into the Tower of London as a kind of subterfuge to disguise the fact that his mother was smuggling a Jesuit in to meet another Jesuit. He grew up with a real sense of danger. And then, of course, with loss, he lost his brother, Henry, when Henry was just 19 to plague. He lost six babies. He lost his wife, Anne. So he knew fear and dread. And yet he insisted till the end of his life, till his death, that you are an astonishment and it behoves you, therefore, to be astonished. He wrote that, he says, compared unto... The, a man, the world itself is a dwarf. You know, a single human soul is larger than the world itself. And that he could hold those two things, this sense of us as miraculous, his sense of, of sex as a kind of semaphore for the, for the human living infinite, his sense of sex as maybe a kind of, of love as an answer to, a, to an unspoken and perhaps unarticulable question. And also to say we are a disaster, that he could hold those two together, often in one poem. It, it, it is wonderful. Very early on in your book, you, you talk about uh, his view that, um, and you allude to it just there, that man is both a catastrophe and a miracle. And, and in his very short life, he died, we think, before the age of 60. Extraordinary things happened to him. And, and I... I was so delighted to see you win with this book because I encountered Dunn when I was at school as a teenager, not uncommon, and found him not incomprehensible but definitely difficult. Yeah, He is. I think, of course, he's known as one of the most difficult poets in the English language. With the book, one of the things I was hoping to do was to offer people just the tools that you need to be able to unpick him. Because when you do, you get a kind of unfurling of a victory flag. He is worth your work. 
But the difficulty wasn't um, an accident. So he was more difficult than his contemporaries, not just difficult because 400 years have passed. He wrote, you know, I sing not siren-like for I am harsh. And often he was putting so much into so compressed a space that it does require the full focus of your attention to unpick it. But that is in some way a kind of stand-in for his broader idea about the imperatives of what it was to live. Because in one of his last sermons near the end of his life, he writes, uh, you know, no man sleeps from uh, Newgate to Tyburn, from the place of imprisonment to the place of execution, and yet we sleep through our entire lives awake. And that, this idea of like awake is his cry, and I think it's written into, embedded in the text. You you speak with such committed passion about Dunn, and and you profess in your book to be uh, evangelical about uh, the the project that you've embarked on. I, I I wonder though about how daunted you were, even though you encountered him as a young child. Uh, you know there have been other biographies. John Carey wrote uh, a wonderful book about him. Uh, Stubbs also wrote a biography that that is seen to be fairly definitive. I mean, to what extent were you daunted by what was already out there about him written by writers very recently? I think especially Carey. Carey's book, uh, John Donne, Life, Mind and Art, is not just one of the best books about John Donne ever written, maybe the best, uh, but also one of the best. I think this of one gives gives him a run for his money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is, it is a, like it is a staggering piece of how to do scholarship. I loved that book, so um, I'm allowed to say this now that it's won the prize. I found this book so painful to write. I am so so grateful to have won because, in part, it it justifies the fact that I I waded through such doubt when writing this doubt that I should be doing it when there is this, this when Carey's book is so beautiful um John Carey is um his own kindness was one of the reasons that I kept going um and this also, is also the third attempt at the book yes. you, it took you 10 years to write which I think people listening will be astonished <laughs> by in and of itself because you are still exceptionally young can I reveal that you are just 35 um so 10 years to write it but the third effort was the one that you were most happy with. Tell yes. us about the other two. So 10 years, including the four years of my PhD and the and the year preceding that in which I worked on the sermons. Um, 10 years of thinking about John Donne. 10 years Dunn, of thinking then. about okay. John Donne, exactly that. <laughs> um, so I rewrote it so many times because the first one was too academic and it felt often like I was sort of um, forgetting. There are two questions when you're writing about the past. What happened and does it matter for this book? Um, and, you know, the discipline of does it matter? It, the, the writers I admire most, Hilary Mantel, who I think is, you know, one probably when she was alive, the greatest living writer in English, staggering. She talks about this, the, the discipline of deletion. She called um, Wolfall a triumph of deletion. And I deleted a lot before I got to the book that is super infinite because you end up almost sort of just like showing off that you've done your homework. Um, and so I sort of tried to rein that in. And and really, I think the thing I wanted to, to offer with this one, it, you know, it, it, in if so far as it's, it's different from the others, was um, a sense that I, I want people to read done and read this book and then read Dunn and then fall in love with Dunn and then find something in Dunn that will sustain them. Because there is in Dunn, he offers you so much. He offers you a bulwark against anti-intellectualism, against um, the quite cheap ways that a lot of media talks about love. He offers you a sense of your strangeness. And I really wanted the book just to be a way into that offering. Let's talk about him as a, a poet who writes about desire in the way that only John Donne does. Um, th tell us about who he wrote for, who his audience was, and to what extent were any of his most erotic, well-known love poems written for his his wife and more? So this is one of the things that we don't fully know. 
we do know that a lot of the earliest rakish verse, so a lot of people who know a little bit about Dunn would have got the idea of, you know, to his mistress going to bed, you know, um, a man sort of coaxing a woman into taking off her clothes or the flea, uh, which imagines a flea first sucking him and says it sucked me first and now sucks thee and in this flea our two bloods mingled be, um, a sort of like quite a larry sexual metaphor. And... Um, it's very unlikely he was writing those for women. He was almost certainly writing them for his small group of friends who would also have been writing similarly like licentious, slightly wild verse. And then the more serious love poetry. It's very difficult to date because, of course, we have no poetry in John Donne's own handwriting except one in, in Latin. Um, and so we can sort of only guess, but sometimes you can tell because the woman he married was called Anne Moore. And he puns on her name. And, you know, he says, um, uh, you know, uh, I, he talks about this wonderful poem, Love's Growth. He says, um, Methinks I lied all winter when I swore my love was infinite, if spring made it more. And that more was for her. And, and you're sitting opposite me, Catherine, and you are able to just like that at the at the click of a of a brain synapses just able to tell us and quote from Dunn which is so so impressive um and I know you've lived with him for 10 years so so that one understands that but still it, it doesn't stop um impressing me I have to say um let, let's talk about the 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 misogyny because you don't you don't let him off the hook you know here's this man who for so many has been heralded as the the uh love poet um because he is misogynistic. Exactly. I think it would be such a mistake to think that John Donne is a straightforward celebrant of women. Um, there is, There are a lot of instances, both in the poetry and more in the prose paradoxes that he wrote, um, which sort of demean and are scathing about the female soul, the female body. Um, I, I, as I say in the book, it would be nonsensical to try John Donne as a misogynist by our own terms because of course like we need to bring the full barrage of nuance that we can when we think about the past but even for his time there were texts which would have been impressively nasty um, and I think one just has to acknowledge that because to pretend it isn't so is to fail to acknowledge that he had a a bitter and a vituperative corner to his mind and he unleashed it on women. And the title of the book, Super Infinite, that also comes from a sermon. It does. So I love this about Dunn. This is one of the things that um, John Carey pointed out, that he liked to add the prefix super to, to words that did not need super. Um, super eternal, super miraculous, super dying. And in one of his sermons, in fact, two of his sermons, super infinite. And the reason I love this, this idea of somebody for whom infinite is not enough, that kind of courageous hunger, that kind of intellectual grandiloquence, um, but also the kind of, you know, the, the, the slight lunacy of it. I, I love that mix that he puts into his work. And also in the title, you've got the word... The transformations of John Donne. The other prefix, of course, he loved was trans. Trans, exactly. So he he uses this prefix, you know, um, transform, transubstantiate, transpose, transport, but especially transform. It's across his work. And I think in that prefix, trans meaning sort of across, um, he saw, you know, b b beyond, he saw something in us, our, our transformability, that it is never... It is never that you are just one thing. You are constantly changing and you are quicksilver and at your best alchemic. Do you want people to be as transformed as you clearly have been <laughs> by reading this book by John Donne? I would love people to read it and feel that in Donne they might be offered a mode of thought that they could carry with them through their lives and that might offer them some form of solace. In your acceptance speech last night, you quoted one of the most famous lines from Dunn, No Man is an Island. Uh, and you, 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 the context of it was that you wanted to announce this extraordinary generosity of, of sharing the prize. Just tell us about that and why you wanted to do that. 
So I'm going to split the prize money of um, £50,000 uh, half to a, a brilliant um, climate change charity that I have um, been working with a little bit called Blue Ventures, which works with um, communities affected by climate change, but also trying to build more sustainable ways of living. Um, and, and they are remarkable. David Attenborough is one of their patrons. And and another one to a, to a refugee charity, because... Um, it's, a, it's not that I'm a, a saint. I, I would love fifty thousand pounds. I do. I would very much love a big pair of diamond earrings. But, but you could have kept the money, <laughs> Catherine. <laughs> but, but my reckoning was this: when he says no man is an island, he says every man's death diminishes me, for I am involved in mankind. And I, my reckoning is every great thing done elevates us all, but every injustice diminishes us all and and man-made climate change and the brutality of inequality that is creating a refugee crisis those diminish us all and I thought they could make better use of that money than I could I don't know diamond earrings sound very very oh lovely. I know I know I'll have to <laughs> if people buy the book then I'll buy diamond earrings with the money excellent, from that excellent excellent <laughs> the royalties yeah. is what we need um, I, 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 I want to ask you a couple of other questions uh, one of them is really to do with the relationship between the writing that you do for children and which is what you have been known for up until now as well as your, your academic work um, and, and this book because the, the chair of the judges Caroline Sanderson did talk about your playfulness and and I, I wonder about that connection in your own mind and how conscious it has been for you, because not only is the book beautifully written, but there is a there is a, a joy in what you are asking people to do, which is open their minds to something. I think they they feel to me not dissimilar. Of course, there are different disciplines and there are one of the great pleasures of writing for adults, of course, is that there are jokes and ideas that you can unfurl that you wouldn't offer children because they just don't have the, the landscape yet. Um, but I love writing for children. I love the intensity of their imaginative power. Um, I love that when you write for children, often they will, um, when they tell you about the book, they say it's their you know, their favourite scene. And they'll often describe a scene that isn't in the book. They have added to the book as they go. I love the idea of writing for someone whose imagination is so great they expand what you have given them. But in terms of the writing, it's not that different. The disciplines are the same. The disciplines of, like, of vividness and distillation and the disciplines of, of, of just reworking it until it says, as near as possible, it's always going to be a compromise, and as memorably as possible, the thing you want to say. Are you done with Mr Dunn? Oh, never. No. Um, there, are, there are things in the works I'm not allowed to speak about, but I think one day I will um, write a novel about Anne Dunn. I started one while I was writing the book, really more as a bid to keep her alive for me, because we know so little about her. Um, but I, I can't picture ever being done with done. And, and that idea of inventing um, in a non-fiction book is really interesting because we know so little about about her, but also the gaps that we have about the man himself because so much of what he left us was destroyed in all kinds of ways, letters and so on. Exactly. So he burnt the friend's letters that he has that they wrote to him because he's felt that they were sort of part of the person. So when they died, he would burn the letters, which is a sort of touching gesture, which archivists around the world are just screaming in agony <laughs> about. Um, we lost his commonplace book. If we ever find that, it went missing. Um, we can trace it a certain... He left it to Isaac Walton, Isaac Walton said his son, his son left it to Salisbury Cathedral, and then it vanished. So I'm just hoping someday somebody will find that. But until then... Oh, Oh, I want you to find Oh, him. I know. Like, you know, the scavenger hunt begins. <laughs> um, but he, um, he, he was somebody about whom there are question marks. There are big gaps in his life. About Anne, we know so little. And so the book, it, it, it never becomes fiction. It's always clear what would be a, an educated guess based on comparative people. So, for instance, with Anne, just looking at how similar people may have lived. Um, and then otherwise, it's it's always a, one is going to have to read what there is and, and decide what you believe. 
Well, I, for one, can't wait for you to write that novel <laughs> uh, about Anne Dunn. Uh, Catherine Rundle, thank you so much thank and you. congratulations again. Now, if you missed the award ceremony on the 17th of November, you can watch this at BG Prize Facebook, YouTube and on the Bailey Gifford Prize website. The dinner and this podcast were generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. And to discover more about Super Infinite or any of the shortlisted books, do please head over to at BG Prize on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram or TikTok. You can also sign up for the newsletter through our website. And as always, thanks again to the Blavatnik Family Foundation for supporting this podcast. That is it for this year and the Bailey Gifford Prize. A huge, huge congratulations once again to Catherine, who has proved that, as always, the best stories are true. I hope you'll join me again next year when we'll be delving into more brilliant non-fiction. Until then, bye-bye. Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation.